How is everybody feeling? Yeah? Okay, this is gonna be a really fun conversation. Um, I, uh, this is an incredible honor to be hosting this conversation about masculinity in a space uh, with Playboy. Uh, the idea, and that's the key word, the idea, of masculinity and femininity are changing right now. And we see that in the way that people, and especially younger generations, are exploring or identifying as or questioning norms, um, as well as through the rise of sexual fluidity, uh, gender nonconforming, breaking down of binaries. Um, and this creates a huge opportunity for Playboy. We're a brand that for, in a magazine, I would actually say, uh, uh, magazine, I'm the executive editor of the magazine, just, yeah, so that's, the, that's from the perspective that I will be speaking from. Um, we, for a long time, uh, our tagline was entertainment for men, and we took that off, okay, because Playboy is a universal brand. It's about pleasure. It's about who you are. It's about owning your identity, and so much of that is, is so important for who we are as a magazine. That being said, that when we talk about masculinity and femininity in this moment, what is that going to look like? I wonder, what does that mean for Playboy? And I am so incredibly honored to have two people who have had these conversations with us previously within the past year um, and who, ex whose experiences are really, really going to offer some, some new light here. Um, I would like to, I have to introduce them, but I would like to start by reading uh, uh, from, from articles that we did an interview with uh, Sharunas. And, and Nico wrote something for us uh, last year uh, tied to the Pride season. So I'm going to start with what, what Nico wrote for us. Through my own public education of sexuality in the queer community, I began to break down the binary construct of gender, male and female, and its emphasis on division. It is no secret that we are markedly, markedly divided here in the U.S. and abroad. Binary pronouns, he and she, tend to be divisive, which is one of the many reasons I've started using they, them pronouns for myself. And when asked if my pronouns are plural, I say yes. I am a multi-dimensional, dynamic human being, and we all are. And with that, I want to talk about a little bit about what Shrunas told us. He told us, with the climate that we're in right now, especially black men, you have to be the strongest one, the most, most athletic one. You have to run the best and jump the highest, all the way back from the slave days, which is also what I think goes into effect when I see police officers treating black men a certain way versus the white man, because there's this rooted thought of, oh, we're more aggressive and the tougher one, and so they handle it as such. We're taught that things like, we're taught things like that. You're not supposed to cry or really be emotional uh, and show your feelings. And I think that says so much, and we're going to get into all that. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Nico. Actor, author, and activist Nico Torrello is best known for their role as Josh on Darren Star's hit comedy uh, series Younger, which will premiere its sixth season on June 12th. They released a poetry book, All of It Is You, last year to wide acclaim, and will release an anticipated memoir titled Space Between on September 17th. Uh, Sharunas Jackson is known for his role as Dro on HBO's Insecure, as well as Good Trouble on Freeform, and most recently, Games People Play, which airs on BET. We are proud to welcome them to this space. All right. Uh, that was great. Yeah. Yes? That was a okay. solid introduction. Right. Good. I'm getting, I'm getting I want to mess that up. I'm yeah. getting into my flow. Okay. Bye, y'all. Right, come out here. <laughs> I just come to this thing. Um, so we can't talk about masculinity without talking about the root or the, the, the origin of masculinity, which I think is something that we learned from our family, from the people we grew up around. And I want to start the conversation with you because you recently became a father. Yes, I did. Yeah. And yeah. I <laughs> want to, how has that changed your views on I would just say manhood, knowing that the world you create today is going to inform the world your daughter lives in. Right, great question. Um, for me, I think f I was fortunate enough to begin this journey a couple years ago, a few years ago, um, kind of just understanding things differently, going about things a different way. Um, so a lot of the work I did prepared me a lot to become a father, even, I, even though I wasn't expecting for her to come, uh, my daughter's in. Um, I just, I felt prepared that she was here and comfortable because the man I am today is way more open, um, a man that listens, and that's somebody I want to be for my daughter and give her something where, a space where she's comfortable to share anything, right? And I know when we're not around her, me or her mother, Dominique, um, she's going to be at school with different people who are taught different things. And uh, for me, um, 
as a, a, a man who identifies as a straight man, I just want to show her that there isn't a uniform thought, or there's not supposed to be this uniform way of acting um, for a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. um, there's just, to me, I just be a good human being, and that's why I wanted to teach her good morals and stuff like that. So that, that I think that's the main thing. Um, and with her, when she actually got here, I just it just kind of even elevated even more in me to be sure to practice what I preach as well. Mm -hmm. uh. mm -hmm. Nico, you have uh, you told me that it was roughly around two years ago where you your relationship with the gender binary and with identifying as male started to change and shift. Growing up, what, were there role models? Who were, who, who were you surrounded by that were teaching you ideas of masculinity or what it meant, me meant to be a man versus a woman? Yeah, I mean, I think I was raised in a kind of special environment. The, the women in my household actually claimed the masculine roles, you know? In, in, in so many ways, the difference between masculine energy and feminine energy is masculinity is an energy directed at survival, right? And femininity is an energy directed for creation. And um, the women in my house fought for the kids, and the men very much so created space for themselves, right? And I think that th that's something that a lot of people can relate to. Um, but through these father figures in, in my own life, I was able to even recognize, like, a queerness that exists in all forms of masculinity and femininity, for that matter, you know? Um, and my own journey to this understanding of, of the gender binary and the construct that it is, and even the construct that masculinity and femininity is, has been a real journey. And it's been um, a real privileged journey, you know, that I am evil that I'm even able to speak on an issue like this. And that's something that I'm still to this day coming to terms with. Yeah, when I was trying to put together some questions about where to start, you know, the question I didn't want to start with was what is masculinity? Yeah. Because I think that we need to get away from thinking it's one thing, right? We need to, we, we need to say that it's, it can be, it's an energy, it's a way you look at the world, it, it informs all that. Um, but when I was thinking about my personal experience and, and identify as, as a gay male, um, where my father came from, he was an immigrant, and uh, he was emasculated as such. He came to the country and he had to had drop his name, Jaguan, and take on Mike's name. Mm -hmm. uh, his name is Mike, and, and Michael, and completely whitewash himself. Mm -hmm. And to see that growing up, I didn't realize what that meant. And that seeing that someone change their identity to be fit in around the people around them, <clears throat> and, and informing that that was my father who did that. Mm -hmm. right. you know? right. I mean, the whitewashing of masculinity is something that's been happening for a very long time, you know? I think pre-colonialism, the definitions of masculinity and femininity were a lot different than they are today. And when this entire planet was colonized, right, everyone was told this is what a man is supposed to be, this is what a woman, a woman is supposed to be, this is what you're supposed to believe in, and everything that you believed in prior to that, you need to throw away. And since then, it's really like, there's been this homogenized definition of masculinity and femininity. And now we're at this point where we have access that we've never had before, global access to everybody and everything. Mm -hmm. And it isn't this like redefinition of masculinity or femininity, it's really this reawakening of something that was thousands of years ago, you know? And we're able to bring that back, and I think that's really incredible. Yeah. Yeah. When, you, when you say the word homogenization, um, something particular to your experience is that you, you are Afro-Latino -Lat mm -hmm. or Afro-Latinx. Afro I don't know mm -hmm. which you, you, you are drawn to. Yeah. And there are ideas of masculinity within the African-American community and within absolutely. the Latino community. And growing absolutely. up, I'm sure you had to absolutely. see both signals from both sides, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, growing up, you would think um, that maybe and I got it from both parents, you know. My, my, my mother is, was born in Panama, right? She's Afro-Latina. Uh, she's mixed. Both my parents are mixed, right? Black, uh, mixed black people. And, uh, but my mom's heavy in the, you know, the, La the Latino culture. She, her first language was Spanish, born in Panama. Um, if anything, I would say maybe there was things that were forced on me more so from my mom, actually, than my dad. Now, I mean, they both had it. Um, but it's just interesting because this is just what they were forced, you know, uh, this is what they were taught. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, you know, got to be rough and everything like that or, you know, it, and then they would use things like maybe, um, and not just, I'm just talking about the people in the neighborhood, like other, pe other kids' parents. 
and stuff, you know, boy, you know, falls and cries, like, are you a girl? You know, things like that, that's like, yeah. that's forced on you. Um, so, you know, you're taught to be this tough boy and, you know, you're not supposed to cry. Um, I, you actually quoted that, um, what I did with you guys. And any time that I was, um, you know, uh, doing any sports and stuff, being competitive, you know, you had to be really tough and everything. Um, and that had to carry out, uh, carry on and do a lot of things, um, which is funny because there are certain things that I didn't understand. So even if um, for the first time having like a gay friend, like that was weird. <laughs> and I didn't even... To, you know, at some point, because you're And who you're told you that was weird, things. right? Like My mom taught, taught, taught me that was weird, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, like, my mom was like, oh, like, mijo, you got to, you know, just be careful. And I'm like, what, what? What happened? Like, you know, and it's just like, that's so crazy. Like, you know, she's telling me to be careful. Like, <coughs> is he going to harm me? You know, he's my friend. You know what I mean? And I was like, they're not, you know, forcing you to, to view things their way. It's just what they were taught, you know? And maybe my dad, it's, it's crazy because, like, my dad at one point, um, might have been a certain way, but I've seen how he's evolved because how I have, you know? And so he, he's someone I would listen to, like, oh, wow, like, you know, I didn't think about it like that. And, you know, so he's a little bit more open to things. Now, like, if I go back home to Panama and stuff like that, there's a certain ways. You know, I have a cousin who's gay, and it was a little rough for him to come out. Um, and, you know, we're just taught certain ways that I'm supposed to pass down to my kids. Like, that's, that's the mentality that this is what they think. So that's why bringing back in the fatherhood thing, that, that's where it's going to be my job to like turn that, and I'm hoping that continues on, where I'm not just feeding them toxic material, you know, mm -hmm. to, to in, ingest, so yeah. Right, and, and you know, I remember the first signal that I got. I, I grew up with a sister two years older than myself and, and a sister who's two years younger, and I had a brother who's 10 years older. Mm -hmm. um, so I played with my sister. They played with girls, and I remember going to kindergarten once, and I was playing with like the little house setup toys, yeah. and a boy came over. He's like, why are you playing with girl, right. the girls' toys, or why are you playing with girls' stuff? Right. And I did, in my own household, that, that wasn't told to me. That was my family. Mm -hmm. right. So it was, that was like, I remember that was the first signal for me that I had to act a certain way. Right. Um, I don't right. know if, if there was a defining or a moment of impact, <clears throat> maybe not that young, but just in general, where you're like, oh, right, I'm not supposed to act this way. Yeah, I... I grew up playing hockey um, and in a big Italian family where, you know, to be a dude meant one specific thing, right? And when I transitioned from being an athlete to being a thespian, <laughs> <laughs> um, at a pretty young age, I was introduced to a community of people that, I mean, we all play make-believe, you know? That's our job. We, like, play dress-up, and it is our job to explore our own internal energies. And it's, it's allowed in the theater, right? right. And uh, only then was I able to look back and be like, yo, we're looking at this the wrong way. Yeah. yeah. Well, given that, there's something else I want to read from, from the piece you wrote for Playboy. Please. And I can't put it in any other way. That's the only reason why I'm going to read it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Nico Tortorello, and I am a gender non-conforming, happily married, polyamorous pansexual. In other words, I have always been a mouthful. Hey, no. My sexual freedom has always been a work in progress and isn't everything. Yeah. Let's unpack that. What is sexual? Is it the physiological processes or does it relate to gender? Mm. Is it simply bodily or straightforwardly cultural? Is there a world in which it can all be, be all of it plus more? Sexual starts with sex and anything that starts with sex is going to be messy. Ain't that the truth? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Very true. That's Sometimes true. I hear things that I've written. And you're like, I'm good. Wow. wow. He has a new oh God, book, good. Spaces Between, September 17, yes. 2019. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, you just said one thing, and that's, what, that's why I wanted to read that. Yeah. Can you take us a little bit on that journey mm. to getting from, uh, you know, uh, Chicago suburbs, big Italian family, to, to writing that for Playboy? Yeah. I mean, like I said, it started in the theater, and then I moved to Los Angeles. I moved here and started working in, in Hollywood and film and television, and I was just introduced to queer people, really. Um, and my education started to change. It was only when I really started taking my own life seriously and really asking big questions. Right when I got sober from alcohol like five years ago, I, I, I had extra time right, to, <laughs> to think. And uh, sexuality was, was really important to me. I, I had all of these queer friends, and I couldn't really understand like, just why we were so oppressed right? and how we got to this point where one certain love was accepted and another wasn't. And I started a podcast called The Love Bomb, and I, and I started having these bigger conversations in a, in a public arena, and very quickly I realized that you can't have the sexuality conversation without having the gender conversation. 
And then I started really looking at gender the wrong way. And then my, my ideas of gender are still very much so a work in progress, but have, ha have almost been stripped to an equal playing field for everyone. I know that's kind of a problematic thing to say. But if, if gender isn't necessarily what we were taught it, it is, then what is sexuality, right? Like if, if, if a man doesn't look like a man and a woman doesn't necessarily look like a woman, then sexuality kind of doesn't have legs to stand on. Yeah. And then it just became this like theoretical spiral that I'm constantly finding myself living in and I write fucking garbage like that. <laughs> um, uh, but it's, it's, it's really, I know I already said this, but it's, it's this, it's a really, I recognize how privileged uh, of a conversation this even is. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I was sitting here in the panel, I don't know if any of y'all were in the panel before this, but um, the world is on fire, right? Like this country is on fire and I can't, necessarily put my finger on a certain point in history where th things were okay for everyone. It, it just hasn't ever existed, right? Yeah, that's why I don't get to make it great again. Yeah. For who? For who? <laughs> right. Because me and my folks wasn't out here like, yeah, take yeah. us back to the 50s. Yeah. Like, we ain't, no. you know what I mean? That's just, that. I never understood that, yeah. It's never been great for anyone, and I kind of left that conversation a little, like, defeated. Yeah. Um, and now we're here talking about masculinity. It is, you know <laughs> like, what? I, you know, we we had a Nico and I had a conversation up in the green where before this, and we, we had that moment where I, I was mentioning you can't really um, empathy might not be biologically hardwired in the brain, and that's totally. what that conversation. I left a little defeated too. Right. And how do you and, teach empathy? Yeah, and right. then but but this is what this is where I think going into this conversation about masculinity for anybody who was in that conversation with Roxanne and Kathy is is the idea of masculinity. I, I hear role model almost means synonymous. There's something being a relationship with it, right? Mm. Um, where femininity. There's, there's not, it's, it's not necessarily role model, right? We it depends on who you're asking and, right. and where you're from. You yeah. know? Right. It right. changes drastically right. depending on what part of the world you're having that conversation in. Right. Mm -hmm. I do want to, I do want to ask you about. There, there's another little bit of a, a kink in the uh, your armor of identities. You went from being a college ball player to being an actor. Yeah. Which, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not either one of those. Surprise. <laughs> uh, so I don't have. But don't what, know? what was that? Did you find yourself changing? In terms of the way that you uh, uh, interacted with your team members versus your coworkers, your crew, your cast members, and oh yeah, that's 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 a different environment, hmm. completely. Yeah, I. I what, mean, the what, home what, sociality what, in all of athletics, though, is really something too. I you know, it's crazy. That. Like everything, <laughs> like yeah. I mean, just being in a locker room. There's certain things like, <laughs> if I were to say, I, I used to, I used to do this thing with uh, uh, when I was out, my last college, I was at. Um, just because I, I knew it made them uncomfortable and it was just so <laughs> ridiculous to me. I would rank who looks the best to the worst. <laughs> and I wouldn't put oh, myself number girl. one so yeah. it could be even more. And I'd be yeah. like, Jay, you're the sexiest man here. I'm going to be real with you. And then he'd be like, yo, dog, chill. I'm like, no, embrace it, bro. What's yeah. wrong with you? And I would just do this. And then, and then it would be funny, though, because as I kept doing it, then I'm like, once I get to four or five or six, they're like, oh, there's no way I'm five. He's more better looking than me. <laughs> So I'm just like, it, it doesn't have to be this thing, because at first it was like, there was that whole like no homo culture or like pause, like everything, every time you said something, it had to be like pause, like, or no homo. And I'm Ball like, fire. for what? Yeah. Like, why do I got to say that? I, and so I would just like, I started just being like over the top with them or anything like that, walking in the hallway while I was slapping in the booty, like, all right, bro, get to class, you know what I mean? <laughs> and then like, at just some point, they're just like, all right, like, so... Yeah, going from that where they're just so like that, then being in a space where like oh, we weren't having these conversations, <laughs> like, yeah. this yeah. wasn't a thing at all, you know. Um, that was, uh, I think it was an interesting transition, more so for people other than myself. And when I say that's because I had a clear vision of what I wanted to do ever since I was five. As soon, like I'm, I was raised in California, but I'm from Philly, West Philly, and. Saw Fresh Prince, I saw Will Smith up there, he had big ears like me. I was like, bet, that's it, that's what I want to do. I didn't understand what it was, but I wanted to be a part of that. I was five years old. And then as time went on playing sports, getting taller, things getting more serious. Now you have colleges looking at you, you have professional scouts, like now things are serious. And you're like, whoa, like, okay, this is what I'm gonna do, I guess. Um, and it's interesting, like, especially like being a taller man, like you are expected to be some type of brute, 
athlete something. You know what I mean? Every time I walk somewhere, I, I love doing this. I've definitely done this. Matter of fact, I was in Chicago. I was just telling you recently mm -hmm. where um, people will recognize me from the shows I'm on. Not everybody's going to watch your show, right? So I'm getting recognized, taking pictures. I'm in, uh, I think it was, do they have Tao or uh, Katana out there? And uh, I'm taking pictures, and then this older white couple uh, sees them taking pictures with me, and they automatically know that I'm on the Chicago Bulls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> automatically, they knew it. And they come up, like, they're like, and I knew when they came up to ask for a picture, I'm like, there's no fucking way you know where I'm from. Yeah. Like, you don't know what these people are recognizing me for. Mm -hmm. And so they ask, and they're like, um, you know, could we take a picture? And I'm like, yeah, come on. So we take pictures, and they're like, um, What's your handle? And <laughs> they're like, I'm with someone. They're like, oh, so are, are you coming back next season? And I look at my friend, because I gave her the look when they came up. I was like, and are you going to be back on the team next season? I was like, you know what? You know how the business is. I'm not sure. <laughs> I want a different feel. Maybe we weren't that good this year. I'm breaking things down for them. But like, it's just that that's gonna, they're going to always assume that um, not only like, you know, am I a man, but I'm tall. And also, I'm a man of color. You know, So that's automatically going to be something. You know, like Even going out for roles. Like, um, you have guys like Will Ferrell, Vince Vaughn, you know, Robert Crumb. These guys are 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six and above. Um, but they're not going to be boxing to being like just the athlete. They could yeah. be the doctor. They could be a wedding planner. They could do all that. Um, but for a while, for me, it was just like, I wasn't complaining, but I was just getting like Nike commercials and stuff like that and just being the guy to dunk <laughs> and everything. I'm like, all right. But, you know, I knew what I wanted to transition to. And going from there, I, I knew I was comfortable with myself because – you know, I could talk to my to, to guys I used to play with, and I'm, you know, they'll ask me questions, and I could just see where their mindsets at, you know. So I just, you know, mm -hmm. I'll talk to them for a little bit, and that's it. But this is a space I feel more safe with, just because more people are open-minded, and that was the thing that was a, a relief for me to be around more open-minded individuals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that's Do you great. feel like the fetishization of your body was different in athletics than it is in Hollywood, and which one kind of different. is more intense? Ooh, damn. Are they really different? I mean, they are different. Like, I played professional ball in Asia, right? And I mean, that was a different fetish. Like, they just, <laughs> like they, like there was two ways. Either like the older generation, uh, they, I mean, they're they're mad racist. They would be like running away from me. And my so there's two Americans per team usually, uh, depending on the league. And so me, and my uh, like my boy Ramal, um, he's a black man, darker skins. We go in the elevator and they'll just like run out. That happened to us a couple of times. It was just like. So you know what we started doing? When we would see people, like when we could tell they're about to start acting like that, we acted terrified of them. <laughs> so like, oh no, no, right? And we'll start running from them and be like, come here, we'll like hold each other and stuff. We're like these big ass guys just like looking at them walk by us and stuff. I was like, it was just so ridiculous. Yeah. But then you have people, you know, I, I seen them like I had, a, I had a homeboy, a teammate that was that had dreads, you know, they're touching his hair and stuff like that. And I was just like, oh man, like, you know, it's just, they don't understand. But it was just so like, Weird. So like to be that that's different. But then in Hollywood, it's like there's so many levels just to be brief about it. Cause <laughs> so many levels. It's like um, black people are usually sexualized for sure. Mm -hmm. And then if you even get into that, like being like the ill range with men, you know, it's like the light skinned guy is always going to be. You know, like Jesse Williams is Dr. Sexy on, you know, Grey's Anatomy. He's going to be the, like, dreamy guy. Mm -hmm. It's always going to be that guy. Like me, it's not a role I haven't taken my shirt off in. You know what I mean? And it, you know, <laughs> I'm not like, <laughs> not, like, I'm not, like, mad all the time about it. But I'm just saying, like, you know, I, I understand where, like, what the journey is before I get to that next, mm -hmm. you know, spot. But I do know, like, that there's roles that I, that are, that tend to be easier that are being offered to me or coming my way. And... I see the guy and it's just like, you know, it, the first word is going to be like, um, you know, handsome or strapping or like, you know, the love interest. I'm always going to be serving a woman's story a lot of times. And um, so that, that's been interesting. So I'm like, you know, I'm like, yo, the next one, just make me a meth addict. Yeah, I don't know, <laughs> something. Got my teeth out. I don't know, but yeah. something. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure people watch Younger. Yes. Right, yes. Right, 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 and right, Insecure. Right. Uh, you guys are both sex objects, all right? We're, we're here at Playboy. <laughs> Let's get it out there. <laughs> or they, they, they're, they're very sexy men. But <laughs> wait, what you said about getting a role, um, there is, we can't talk about masculinity without sex and without sexualization. Mm -hmm. um, so then how do you inhabit, when, you're, when you are uh, asked to be, you know, the object of a woman's affection, mm -hmm. um, 
that what that looks like on TV and what that man is going to say, because you you play Nico, you play a man mm -hmm. uh, wanted by women. Um, do you, how do you approach that character, right? How do you approach like, oh, I'm going to make myself uber sexy towards a woman, right? Because wow. it's acting, right? Yeah, I mean, I that is the last thought that I have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think what's really special about Younger, it is it's a show about women, and none of the women on the show are sexualized, really, at all, which is right. so rare for mm -hmm. TV. And the dudes on the show, me and Peter Herman, who plays Charles, are the the ones that are sexualized. I mean, the entire marketing campaign is Team Josh or Team Charles. Like, six seasons later, y'all, we can drop this fucking trope. <laughs> like, this, it, it's not a show about us, but they're still using the men of the show as the storyline to sell which is the complete right. antithesis of why we started making the show in the first place. So I'm in this like weird place of understanding like what the real objective mm -hmm. is of what we're trying to do mm -hmm. um, and how it's changing because it's, it's not really in so, many, in so many ways it's not. It's like super zeitgeisty and of the moment to, to talk about these things, but how are they actually changing? Um, and I forgot your question. I, you know, I don't. I think I was just. I think I was just complimenting you, <laughs> calling you a sex actor. <laughs> um, you. No, uh, but I'm happy being yeah. sexualized on the show uh -huh. if it means they're not. You know yes. what I mean? Right. It, That's the same it, thing that happened on Insecure, yeah. where opportunity right there. We're, right? we're the men were more uh, nude than the women were. Yeah. If um, like during uh, Dro and Molly sex scenes, you will see. It might look like she was naked, but I mean, she was completely covered up with like spandex on Vando, but I was a naked one covering them. And honestly, like you said, I felt fine with that just because I'm thinking about it. I'm like, for what women, have, the actresses have had to go through, mm -hmm. like for ever with uh, cinema, um, they're usually the ones that are showing way more than us, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, so to me, I was, I was fine with it then. And also it was serving a purpose because there was also a dialogue to open up about being in an open relationship. You know, because people look at the relationship a certain way. So that was fine to me. Um, but other than that, I mean, you know, yeah. on that show, I was not mad at it. Well, that, it's, you bring that up. You guys have something in common, although loosely in common. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you've, you have played a character who's in an open relationship, and you identify as polyamorous. And those things are different. Let's, let's just signal that. That mm -hmm. being in an open relationship does not mean you are polyamorous. Um, mm -hmm. But... There is something interesting about the idea that doesn't also mean that there is one man and multiple women. So when you are in a relationship, the idea is that you could, or, or it's been so long that a man is territorial over his woman, his girl, or that there's, you know, that there's that connection, right? The mm -hmm. man of the house, all that, one. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just curious if you guys wanted to compare notes a little bit about the idea of being a, a, um, a man or someone who can open uh, their heart up and actually have sexual relations with multiple people and not be threatened by that, right? Right. right. Because there's a lot of threatening about being like, don't come for, for this, is, this is my person, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's like caveman mentality, right? Absolutely. And you have to just own the people around you. And that's something that has never made sense to me. So I, I can't even recognize a time in my life where I was like, oh, I used to think this way and now I think this way. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of... Uh, having the ability to hold space for multiple partners, I, I don't know that that's like necessarily a masculine trait or a feminine trait. I think that's just like a human trait, right? And I think, um, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> <laughs> you pick this up. <laughs> so I'm picking it up right now. Um, you know, it's interesting you pointed out, like, you know, being, if you're in that situation, because I I did some before where, like, I'm um, involved with a woman, and she had her own situation with another woman, right? And then it just kind of became, like, this whole thing. This is in real life or on the show? This is in real life. Uh, yeah. I'm, my bad. Let me clarify that. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. And, I mean, and it, it's not that, like, we, like... Are, are serious, but we, we, we took a trip. I'm gonna hold on. <laughs> took a trip, right? And it, w it was interesting because I know there's probably even, even certain ways of thinking in a situation like that, right? Where um, a man identifies as a hetero man and I'm with these two women who identify as bisexual, but then like I am, I'm gonna be championed. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? But I, that trip did so much for me because maybe when I was younger for sure, I was like, that would be so dope, like, you know what I mean? Like, they, you know, you kind of fantasize about it. It's more like a fantasy in a way, but they're actually doing it. 
and everybody had respect and care for one another um, that was involved. It was, I'm like, you know, I know I would be champion because that's how people are, you know, are taught in a way, but everyone was getting something emotionally, spiritually, just everybody was getting something. And it's just like, Doug, yeah, that's how it's, Galatari, that's yeah. like, why wouldn't that be? You know what I mean? It's not like, okay, I'm winning. And then y'all too, you know, you guys are pretty happy. No, it's not <laughs> like every, everyone's getting something out of it. And, and that, to me, that's like, what that did for me, that trip was just, I was like, man, do I want this for the rest of my life? Like I was yeah. like going along with it just cause um, every, it was such a, um, to me, it was just a really fulfilling trip for that, like you know, and then continuing on that 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 relationship. Um, but yeah, uh, it was, and I could see <laughs> I was going out in public, and then seeing like what the type of attention we were getting. <laughs> um, it's it, it, it's, and like I said, I, I've seen you know we went out, had our little area, and it's like you know we're in the nightlife and nightclub and stuff. And I can see the dudes looking at me like, man, bro, you over here doing? I'm just like, and I, for and at first it was funny, but then it got like kind of, um, I to me I didn't like how like dismissed them two were. You know what I mean? I didn't like how it was always for me, but like then it's just well, because there were two women. Yeah, I mean, right, exactly. It's totally, I did not like that for for two women to yeah. be out with one guy. Right, exactly. It's like super fetishized situation because mm -hmm. they're two women. But the mm -hmm. second it's two guys out with one girl, then it, then it people really look at you strangely. Freak out. You know? Yeah. Um, but that's just the patriarchy. I mean, that's the world we live in. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm curious in terms of, this is coming from the Playboy perspective or being an editor of this magazine win. Um, you guys all saw that Gillette ad, right, about toxic masculinity. I'm sure a lot of people saw it. We talked about it. Uh, the editors talked about it quite a bit. Um, toxic masculinity seems like a word that people are starting to uh, push, push away a little bit. Um, talk about jumping the shark, right? Trying to sell you razors. Uh, that being <laughs> said, um, in, our, in our next issue, we wanted to do something about that. And I was working with one of my editors. I think Ryan's here. And it didn't feel right to do a, a series, a seven-page, it was a seven-page series of essays about toxic masculinity. It didn't feel like we were pushing the conversation forward. Mm -hmm. So we decided to change it about power. And I'm curious as to thinking about masculinity actually as an energy and not as one thing and knowing that if it's an, if that the, if you can be masculine, you can also be feminine. What is the power? Where does the true power come in in a positive way of balancing those energies within oneself? It, it is the perfect balance of yeah, the two. Yeah. That is the definition of power, at least for me. And it's, yeah, for it's sure. something that's existed forever. I mean, this, this balance of masculine and feminine energies has been written about basically since the beginning of time, you know? Um, and we are at such an imbalance right now. And that is why toxic masculinity has become this, you know, zeitgeisty word. Um, and I think to, what toxic masculinity really is at its core is is not just men, Absolutely. is people not being able to face their own demons, so they push them out on other people, you know? And, but let's be clear, toxic femininity is a very real thing too, you know? Absolutely. Apparently, so. it's not a safe space to say that. <laughs> 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 um, like, but it is, you that, know? That you talk about that balance, like, for me, l me learning that balance, like, I'm gonna get real here kind of hippie with this, right? So I did, all right, all right. Let's, no, no, come on. Yeah, all right, let me lean in with you, I'll lean in with you. I, so you guys know what ayahuasca is? Shut yes. up. Yes. <laughs> I can talk about this forever. Man, look. <laughs> Wait, So I, I, had, I had an experience. Where? Beautiful. Want to know where? Here? Here in LA. <laughs> <laughs> but it was in the safe space. I didn't feel like I was in LA. But um, so, but the, I'll just say, the mm. small part of this experience where I just remember there was, a, I, I saw everything as energies in a mm. way. So I saw like uh, sexuality, I saw that as an energy, masculinity, femininity. So when I, I saw like, I remember seeing the masculine side of me and the feminine side of me really meet and it was this really beautiful thing and I never, it kind of made me understand it. Maybe I've had these thoughts that I just could never put into words but it kind of made me understand a little bit better. And I remember just, so me, I identify, you know, like I said, as a, a straight man, right? Um, I even at times consider myself maybe as an alpha male in, in a sense, but maybe that's because I feel sometimes that status is given to me in a sense. And, but a part of me realized like what makes me feel so comfortable about 
about myself. And so others view that as, um, you know, some alpha type of energy was that I am completely okay with my feminine side and embracing that, right, as much as my masculine side. Um, I think I was fortunate enough where my father, I will say, was the one that would not shame me for crying. Um, and I did get lucky with that because not all the other boys in, in the neighborhood had that. Um, so if we all watch a movie, he was completely fine with crying. And that, because I remember he saw me trying to fight back my tears watching a film one time. And he was just like, let that out. Hmm. He was like, you, you think that make you less than a man? That, that makes you like, you know who, in his, in his words, he said, in more of a man. That's what he thought. If you're able to embrace your emotions and feelings, you know? Um, but you just say, you know, you don't, you know, you don't have to hide that. And I was, I'm, I'm really grateful for that to at least have that because that helped me going on. I mean, I was watching Wally the other day. That's a Pixar movie. Y'all seen that? <laughs> well, I was tearing up in that bitch. I was like, damn, Wally alone? <laughs> so, you know what I mean? It was just so, but, but that wasn't like okay with everybody else. Like people were like, you cried in that movie? Like guys would say that, like it's a weird thing. I'm like, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah but shit moved to me, bro. But like, <laughs> so I think having that balance though has, I think that's, this is the most comfortable I've been in my life with myself, mm. right? The most. And because finding that, that balance and a lot of incredible women and men that, that have been homeboys of mine, but that still have that balance as well, having these people in my life to, to make me realize that and see this balance that I could have um, and not shame me for one or the other um, is something I've been really grateful for and makes me so secure and comfortable mm. with myself at this point in my life, even though there's way more to go, you know, way more to learn, but yeah. I mean, I have drank ayahuasca like over 25 times. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, oh. I study plant medicine fully. For sure, yeah. for sure. And it, the majority of my work, the f first half, mm -hmm. uh, is, was all in masculine and feminine energies. Right. And I think what, what plant medicine does is show you that, that we exist in every part of the natural world. Right. You know? And that masculine and feminine energies exist in every animal, in every plant, like everywhere across the board. I, I mean, you asked me where that came from, mm -hmm. and I actually look at my life as before ayahuasca and after ayahuasca. I wasn't uh, having these crazy. huge grand thoughts. I know it seems crazy, y'all, but like, but it's, it is crazy, it's though. It's fucking like, insane. You're, it's really wild. From 68, we'll be holding the session. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on by. Um, I mean, you're entering different dimensions. Really, you know? really, it's really enlightening. Can, can, Nico, would you be willing to, you know, the idea of rejecting binaries and labels and, and, and coming out in, in, in the way that, that, how you wrote that sentence for us, right? Mm. Um, there's a freedom in that, you know? It's something that I've actually, I, I've definitely experienced the freedom of coming out and knowing myself. Have there been tensions that you didn't, that, that you've had to um, a, a, a battle or face head on or confront that kind of almost push you back into uh, uh, what society wanted you to be? Were there ever moments where you, you were, oh wow, like this is more difficult than I thought, and maybe I have to be, I, I shouldn't have deviated this far from the norm? Yeah, I mean, across the board. I feel like I've come out three different times. I came out as like queer, bisexual, and then I came out as non-binary, and then I came out as, as polyamorous. Like they all hold these different weights, right? And depending on what I'm actually talking about, somebody will have something to say. And what I've actually been most surprised by over the years is the flack that I actually get from within the LGBTQ community for having specific fringe conversations, right? You start talking about non-binary politics with a group of white cis gay men and you are an alien, right. like yeah. for the most part. Yeah. And um, I mean, just in terms of Hollywood, like. I have had hours and hours and hours of conversations with all, every member of my team on how I'm having, um, how I'm conducting myself, right? Whether it's on a red carpet, in a dress, or on social media, or you know, in the books that I'm writing, whatever it is. And at the end of the day, like, part of my privilege is recognizing that I can get away with stuff that other people can't, right. and that. Is a is a power that I'm not necessarily using for myself, but it's to leverage this conversation, mm -hmm. right, for right. other people. Right. And so much of the gender conversation that I'm having is actually a metaphor for something so much bigger than our genders. It really is. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, you know. I, I think a through line that I, I am finding through this is the idea of what you just put a word to passing, for those who don't know. Um, when, you're, when you are of a marginalized community, you're able to pass as a privileged community first. So for myself, for a long time, I was able to pass as a straight man, even though I'm gay. Yeah. I'm able to pass as racially ambiguous because I have olive, olive skin, but my name is Shane. So I'm able to pass as a white guy. Um, and that's the relationship between being marginalized uh, and, and, and having privilege is being able to pass. Um, we're just, masculinity is a way that in which like the, the energy, the positive energy and the role and the opportunity that we have in how we define masculinity, but how it's defined, defined by society, it seems as if you have to pass a certain way. You have to pass everybody's radars as a certain way. Um, and you have to live up to something. And, and like, I think there's huge opportunity for, for us to, to, in this conversation, you know, I asked mm -hmm. both of you, what do you want to get out of it? And you said, what, whatever, whatever it brings to us, you know, so just being open to that. And I mean, the fact that we both have done ayahuasca, like, I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> I got everything I need out of this yeah. conversation. <laughs> like, there's a reason we're talking. Right, that's yeah. it, yeah. <laughs> no, um, you know, it's just, this type of conversation to have, I, even in like, um, like, you know, in that, that group chat you have with, your, you know, your friends, um, we're all different, and uh, there was uh, a conversation that sparked. Have, did anybody see the Red Table Talk recently with Aisha Curry? Okay. For some reason, there was issues with what she was talking about, right? She basically said, um, out of all the crazy stories that came out of this conversation, this is the one that was like, whatever. Anyways, so... She talks about, you know, all these women, it was the Currys and the Smiths, you know, it's a lot of, their, their men are powerful men, you know, um, or very known. So her husband being Steph Curry, I mean, he's MVP of the MV, M NBA, you know, star. Um, she talked about seeing uh, Jada ask, how do you guys manage, you know, having all these women come at your men? How do you handle that? Um, they went down to it and they, you know, talked about how they handled it. But then she said something along the lines of, um, you know, it sometimes though it does get interesting that all these women are coming at uh, your man, but then like no men show you a, any attention. Like so, it's like it kind of makes you look at yourself like, dang, like you know, she could just kind of wants to know she still got her or something like that. You know, just attention. You know, everyone wants like some type of love, attention, appreciation, and because she said that, it was like this conversation, so in a group message, we're talking about it, and a co you know, it's kind of split. Uh, so like, there's nothing wrong with what she said. All she said is that her man gets all the attention and no one gives her attention, so it, it, she kind of looks at herself a little like, you know, dang. And, so, well, and then the other is like, man, you married, you should not be like, you know, don't embarrass your man like that, boom, boom. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. Like, I literally had to say, in the vo I didn't even feel like I put in a voice, I was like, I'm too exhausted to have this conversation <laughs> with y'all right now because you're not even gonna get at it. Like, you guys are too far gone for this, so let's just move on from this. But it was just conversation. God, bit my damn lip right now. You see that shit? <laughs> 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 Woo! <laughs> Anyways, uh, right. <laughs> um, so going on with the conversation, you could just see how what we're talking about right now, how it affects different people. Mm -hmm. You know, how open-minded some are, how closed-minded others are, um, and... So like the ownership, especially men, like that's my one. You shouldn't be saying like, I'll be mad if she said that. I'm like for what? Like that, she ain't, she ain't out here cheating on him, you know, as far as we know, you know what I mean? But I'm just saying like, she ain't like out here cheating on him. She's a good mother, you're gonna be mad. She doesn't do nothing wrong and she just says that mm. while you're getting all this love from women. And, like, you know what I mean? Like, bro, he plays an NBA, what she expects? It's just like, okay, all right. I'm, I was just like, I was over it. But just to see that, I'm like, I remember, and I told one of my, the one that I, that was annoying me the most, my homeboy, I was like, I'm doing a panel Saturday, bro. I think you should stop by, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even tell him what it was about. <laughs> but yeah, so, um, yeah, it just, it just, it's just, it, it's just interesting to see how it affects different people. Yeah. But I'm just, I'm just hoping, you know, I, I'm very happy to be, like we said, we're very privileged to be having this conversation because in other places in the world, you cannot talk right. like this at all without severe punishment. Yeah. Um, so just see where this goes. Is, uh, I'm ex in in intrigued. Mm -hmm. I'm intrigued. So excited. Yeah. I think just going off that thought. I mean, the way that we react to things, the way that people react to news or whatever is happening, mm -hmm. is a direct reflection of our own internal issues, right? That are coming to play, and that's mm -hmm. why, like, we put so much emphasis on big things that are happening in the world or news or this interview. Right. Um, 
because we can't deal with what's going on in ourselves, so we put it on all of these other things. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why we watch The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Yeah, you know? escapism. Yeah. 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 Well, guilty pleasure. Um, we, could, we could go on. We're going to take some questions, though. We want to hear from you guys. So uh, raise your hand, and we'll give you a mic. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hi. Is that him? Hey, buddy. Hot seat. It's that time. So, this is the both of the panelists. What are the five most, your five top things that emasculate you or challenges your masculinity? Mm. That's a big question. What I think challenges my masculinity. Myself, 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 myself. <laughs> <Okay>. Right. <laughs> so we are dialogue. our own worst enemies, you know? Yeah. And if, you, if I'm standing in my own way of really understanding what masculinity even is, then I'm not going to get there. Yeah, I think it's for me, it's breaking down, you know, what I, what I was taught. Um, there's just even, s like for an example, I remember being in high school and because, you know, however family members felt about homosexuality, yeah. I remember having like friends come out or, and I, one, this one thing, this is probably, uh, this is one thing I'm ashamed of, right? I remember I had a friend that come out, I was in high school, 15. I remember he came out and I got like mad at him. Hmm. And I, I'll be real with you, I was, it wasn't even a real emotion and feeling in me. Mm. I just thought that that's how I was supposed to react. And I remember realizing this years down, and I was like, wow. Because I remember in the moment, like, I mean, because later on we were just like, I was like, man, we're cool. It just like, for some reason, I thought that's how I was supposed to react because that made me a man and like more than and he was less than. And I remember realizing that pretty quick actually after that like a week went by, but I just remember being like, that just, that, it didn't even feel real. Like, why am I acting like this? Just because like my mama would have been like uncomfortable about this or like whatever other family members I have. Like that's, if that's not me, that's not me. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't care. Like, yeah, who, who you are is who you are, right? So, uh, and I remember having that conversation with him and uh, that was a friend I had that really helped me um, as far as opening up my mind because what I was surrounded by just wasn't that, giving me that. Um, and that was a big challenge for my, I, to me, it was my masculinity, just coming to terms with, like, you know, just, you know, being wrong, you know, about certain things, um, trying to, like, force my views on the other people. Can't give you five, but that's the best I could do. <laughs> yeah. Another question? Um. Hi. Um, I guess like something that I personally struggle with, and then I'm wondering how you guys feel about it, um, is the reconciliation between like gender being a public political act and something that you present to others, while also being something that's individual and personal and something that you have to understand um, in your own um, microcosm. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering like how you reconcile that identity like between what you present to others and what, um, because a lot of like what you're talking about, it seems like gender is something political in what you're talking about. Like it's something that like you, you, you present to others. And I'm wondering like how that, uh, how that plays into your own personal Yeah, experience. I mean, I think there's a real fluidity to all of it. There are some times where I will feel like hyper feminine, but present super masculine just to balance it out or the other way around or one day I'll wake up and I'll have, like feel a great mix of the two. Um, I think I'm in a specific position where like I'm able to play with it and it's safe for me, you know? But so many of my friends, specifically trans feminine people of color in New York City still to this day walk outside and get, it's my best friends, get spit on, hit every single day they walk outside. And, um, so much of the work that I'm actually doing right now is to bring that conversation to spaces that, that aren't having them, right? People don't recognize, like, it, is, it was the deadliest year for trans women in the United States last year, mm -hmm. to date. 
Yeah. But we have shows like RuPaul's Drag Race and Pose, snatching Emmys left and right. I mean, the girls are gagging for these death drops, but these girls are out here fucking dropping dead, and nobody cares. When Matthew Shepard died, the white cis gay man, the entire country banded together and did something about it. Why can we not do something about that right now? So yes, gender is absolutely political. And I think I'm dealing with it on a personal level, too. Um, but like in the larger scheme, my, my personal journey through gender is so much more um, global than this body. It just is. Because I recognize I have the power to talk about it and make changes in ways that other people can't. Mm. Yeah. So, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, he, yeah, he, that was, I thought that was more geared for you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. We're good. Next question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's basically it. <laughs> Hi. Uh, this is actually a question for the entire panel. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the question is, Playboy itself is no, no longer a strictly male magazine. So, which is going to be shocking to some people that haven't seen the transition for, uh, for the last few years mm -hmm. from the time that um, its founder passed away and creative directors changed and all this other stuff. So there's going to be a lot of men that are not in the same uh, ayahuasca space. <laughs> uh, even though they may not have noticed the history of the magazine itself, like uh, I noticed that on the Instagram post, uh, one of my old teachers, Allen Ginsberg, was actually uh, in an issue from 1969, mm -hmm. uh, which I have that issue. And I actually saw the cover of that issue. Of course, it wasn't mentioned that like the other things that were in that. But Ginsburg, if anyone doesn't know, was uh, um, a yeah. uh, poet and gay right, activist. Really and, yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but uh, also uh, you're dealing with also different communities, as you well know. And within those different communities, you're going to have different views of masculinity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as friends of mine and I say all the time, it's like, you know, sometimes like bros hitting each other in the arm and like, you know, like roughing each other up and things like that is actually protection against bullies in a way. You know, it's like, you no, know, so you can you can kind of like man up and you can quote unquote and mm -hmm. like kind of push against these people. And maybe you can have a conversation with them later. But like at first point is what is the role of an international brand that has a history of how many years now? What? 65. 65 years yeah. going to take in, in a sense, retraining an entire culture of men. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's already happening. <laughs> you know? And also, Take that away. And also <laughs> what do we do as individuals, whether in media or in media, you know, do to uh, affect that. I mean, if you look at the Instagram comments of like specifically the Ezra Miller pictures that were mm -hmm. posted on Playboy or my oh, picture, yeah. like the shit that people are saying, you know, people are canceling Play. Those dudes are canceling Playboy and they're going and watching porn on online, right? And they're just gonna drop Playboy. And I guess your question is how do we bring them back into this conversation? Like retrain they, that. They're gone. That's fine. Yeah. But like, but there is also like, you know, I have a fourteen-year-old son. You know, my fourteen-year-old son is like completely fine with all sexuality. Mm -hmm. You know, as well as my uh, you know, seventeen-year-old daughter. Right. Uh, my four-year-old daughter is probably going to be even better. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. So it's like, so sixty-five years. What's the next sixty-five? Years? Um, I, I, well, I, the next sixty-five years starts here. Right, in this room, right? Mm -hmm. um, to, to relate to what I said earlier about how for a long time this, this magazine, which we, we are fully aware of the impact this magazine and this brand has had culturally um, in, in, all, in all ways and all forms. The idea of taking off something entertainment for men does not, and taking that off does not mean that the magazine is no longer entertainment for men. Um, if you were to flip through the issue or see what we're doing, we are presenting 
um, all, the, the, uh, the world that, as we see it. And we are working to create a world in which, in a culture, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and it's gonna, and like you said, it doesn't start with one article, nor does it start with a press release, okay? It doesn't start with one event. But what it does is you, everybody in this room, going out and, and saying something and hoping that, you know, with, with us, it, we, we, we're not leading the charge, nor, nor should, do we claim all that, that responsibility to lead the charge in this and re-engineering the next generation. The world in which Playboy launched is very different. We didn't have social media. We didn't have, we, our platform was amplified. We have these interviews here, and we gave these, these people and that Allen, Allen Ginsberg was a Playboy interview, 10,000 words, right? We, we, that, that was fantastic. That doesn't necessarily work the same way. So what we, what we can do, though, is take that photo of Ezra Miller and put it on our Instagram with 7.3 million followers and say, hey, this exists, and this is okay, and this is real, and this experience is valid, and everybody else's experiences are valid, and we are here to talk about that, and we want to work through that. And, and in terms of changing one generation, you know, uh, uh, that we, Playboy can't do that, all right? But we can contribute to it, and we can right. try, and that's what we are, we are working to do. And, and, um, and we, we have these conversations all the time in the office, all the time. Was what? I'm sorry? Today. Oh, yes. Uh, about like an hour ago. Yeah. It's the whole spectrum here. We're celebrating yeah, yeah. the spectrum, and that's we what this is all about. Show everybody, you know? Yeah. 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 I think, you know, going, because uh, it's not just like moving forward, like, you know, how Playboy does, you know, we're talking about everybody, right? Just a whole generation of people, and... Um, I mean, like you talked about coming from different communities. I, um, me and the men of Insecure did a spread uh, uh, with GQ. It was a comedy issue, right? Um, it was like fun, go goofy stuff. Um, you know, we're wearing short shorts and, um, you know, we're in the pools with floaties, but looking like tough in a sense. You know, we're doing different stuff like that. Um, and I could see just some of the feedback that we got from that, which, I mean, I, we were just, you know, we're having fun. We're, we're, sh we're shooting for some, some uh, a magazine that we loved and, um, you know, seeing how, like, uh, you know, we're, we're being called gay and everything like that, and that's still going to be used as a negative, of course. And, um, you know, just, like, Hollywood's agenda to make the black man gay. I can't stand that shit because that shit is said so much. When Moonlight came out, and just like how there was, I mean, like it was a, a respect to film, but then you'll just see the people like, you know, how he was a gender to make the black man gay. And I'm just like, I, I don't have enough breath in my body and I'm 6'8", yeah. right? Yeah. I just don't have to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're yeah. Gonna so. Take, we're going to take one more. We have time for one more question. No, we're good? Okay, that's it. I'm so sorry. We're good. Oh, hey. Man, I'm I'm okay, my bad. Hey. No, 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 no,